Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to the James Kennedy Podcast. Here we are again. How the hell are you guys doing? And what the hell have you been doing since we last spoke? I'm guessing you definitely haven't been chatting with Croatian philosopher, author, political activist, and all-round clever, funny, and awesome dude, Mr. Stretchko Horvat. Well, don't worry, because I have, and I'm going to share the conversation with you in about one minute's time. So hold on to your seatbelts, man. But before we jump into the conversation with both feet, I'm just going to come out and say it. Have you subscribed to the podcast yet? Have you given me a follow? Have you given me a star rating, a review, a comment, or anything? Have you done anything for me at all since the last episode? Come on, man. I'm giving you all this good stuff for free. Help a brother out. The podcast is available for free and in full on every platform, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, CastBox, even YouTube. God damn it. But don't tell me you can't find the button to click on. And whilst you're doing that, why not check out my band, James Kennedy and the Underdogs, because we have got some new material coming your way this year, man, as well as shitload of gigs. We're getting around everywhere. So if you're not yet on the mailing list, go to jameskennedystuff.com slash tribe. Join the tribe, put your city in there, and then we'll know where you are and we'll come and see you. If you can't even be asked to do that, then at least come and join us on Instagram at jameskennedyuk. Whereupon you should be furnished with even more free goodness, like free music and free videos and all that fucking cool stuff. So don't tell me I'm not good to you guys. But now, speaking of which, it's time to bring on the main man of the moment. We are going to do a deep dive into some super clever stuff. Well, he is. I'm just going to nod along and pretend I'm keeping up. Uh, We're going to talk about Europe and the future of politics and activism and AI and immigration and war and what the fuck is going on in the world and what the fuck we can do about it. So I don't want to waste any time on this episode. I just want to jump straight in and welcome onto the show today's guest. Calling in from Croatia, it is the mastermind, the evil genius, the mind blower. It is the philosopher, author, political activist, and all-round legend, Mr. Stretchko Horvat. Stretchko, thank you so much for doing this, man. It's an honor. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm very excited to be talking to you, James. <laughs> well, I hope it's not going to be a disappointment there, bro. <laughs> uh, I, I, like I said, I'm going to let you do all the clever stuff. I'm going to like load myself up on caffeine so that I can keep up with your with your amazing brain and, uh, and do my best to see if I can make it to the end. But I thought we'd start with a biggie. I'm going to throw a big one your way because we got a lot of shit going on in the world right now, man. There's a lot of stuff to, to, to delve into. I mean, I wanted to start with getting your take on what the fuck is going on in the world? We've got a conflict in Ukraine, you know, a genocide in Palestine. We've got bombing in Yemen again. The economy's tanking, but then people are getting fucking richer than ever before. Are all these things connected? Is there a plan or are we just in a free fall? What is going on? What's your take? Yeah, thanks for starting with this with this question. Uh, <laughs> and you at least have some coffee and I don't. Uh, well, it re- re- reminds me on this famous uh, response, uh, the German philosopher, a uh, member of the Frankfurt School, uh, Theodor Nadorno, once gave uh, to a Spiegel journalist uh, who asked him, uh, Herr Professor, two weeks ago, uh, the world still seemed OK. Uh, and Nadorno responded, uh, not to me. <laughs> and uh, uh, in that, that sense, uh, uh, of course, what we are witnessing today uh, seems unprecedented. It certainly is unprecedented, uh, given the, the possibility of nuclear annihilation and that human civilization came to a level uh, that we are able to self-destroy ourselves, but also destroy the planet itself uh, together in this ultimate annihilation. So in that sense, uh, it is unprecedented. Uh, uh, but it's not surprising. I mean, the, the 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 occupation of Palestine has been going on for more than a half of a century. Uh, uh, it's not that it started uh, uh, in October this year. Uh, this kind of processes uh, were happening throughout decades. Of course, what we are witnessing now is the 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 the, the, the really the peak. Uh, uh, of uh, mass destruction and and suffering. Uh, uh, what I can see in this whole situation uh, is that global capitalism uh, is unable to resolve its contradictions on the one hand, and that on the other hand, uh, what we can see is not a clash of civilizations as much as this uh, Huntington, Fukuyama kind of dreams are coming back. uh, But what we are witnessing is a clash of various imperialisms. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, the transatlanticists, uh, which means the United States 
uh, together with the United Kingdom and some countries of the European Union. On the other side, you have Russia. On the third side, you have China. Uh, then you have the Arab states uh, and so on. So what we are witnessing is on the one hand, of course, uh, uh, a very worrying, unprecedented situation uh, because of the amount of already existing suffering and the possibility of even more immense human suffering. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in a way, even if it looks depressive, I wouldn't say it's uh, uh, that depressive in the sense that what we are witnessing is the creation of a multipolar world. And that by itself is not good as such, uh, but it's definitely better than being stuck uh, in a in a world in a bipolar world, for instance, where you only have two superpowers. Uh, so I think this kind of situation opens up cracks uh, 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 in the current system. Uh, we could have seen it in the past weeks all across the world, from the massive protests in the United Kingdom uh, to the shutdown protests in the United States. Uh, there is a massive movement all across the world. Uh, but at the same time, this year, 2024, uh, is also the year of major elections in the world. On the one hand, the United States elections, uh, where, as you know, there is not really a real choice if the choice, again, is between Biden and Trump. And on the other hand, uh, European elections uh, uh, in Europe, uh, which is happening just before the summer this year. Uh, and if you look at this kind of representative politics, we're not now speaking about mass mobilizations and social movements who are coming together, uh, but uh, we are speaking about representative parliamentary democracy. Uh, here, the situation, at least to my estimation, has never been worse for the left and for the Greens. Uh, the left uh, uh, is uh, completely lost. Uh, uh, when you look at the polls, for instance, in Germany, you will see that uh, the German left, the so-called Linke, uh, uh, will have a very hard time to even uh, pass uh, uh, and get any seat in the parliament. Uh, on the other hand, the Greens are in power in Germany, uh, but you can see what their politics consists of, especially if you look at foreign politics. About the United Kingdom, I don't really have to talk to you about it. Uh, you know the situation much better than me, but I would say the situation is not better in any other country. So we definitely left the landscape of 2015, 2016, uh, which were the years, you know, cities in Greece, Podemos in Spain, uh, massive mobilizations uh, turning into new political parties. Uh, but these political parties are not new anymore. Uh, many of them collapsed or, or compromised. It's sufficient to look at cities in Greece, uh, where, you know, the, the, the current head of the political party is a former banker. Uh, so it's a logical kind of uh, circle uh, uh, of uh, this tragic experience of the so-called radical left in Greece. And we could go on and on. So in that sense, I would say on the one hand, yes, we have an unprecedented global situation uh, uh, where various existential or even eschatological threats are intertwining and reinforcing each other. So the climate crisis, uh, the nuclear threat, uh, uh, the, the permanent war, uh, the migration crisis, the microplastics and so on, the violence which we, we, which we witness every day, the, the rise of fascism and uh, autocratic systems around the world. Uh, so, but at the same time, what we can witness is the creation of a multipolar world, uh, uh, a new energy in social movements across the world, and at the same time, a complete disaster, I would say, uh, when it comes to left green politics in uh, representative parliamentary democracy. How is that for 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 a co instead of a coffin? <laughs> Nailed it! Nailed it, man. <laughs> that's done more to wake me up than than this cup of coffee right here. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant answer, man. I think that's. Um, I mean, that opens up a whole load of other things which we could dive into. One of the things that I wanted to touch on, which you mentioned towards the end there, was, you know, the impotence of the left, which seems to be a kind of a universal problem. What's behind that? Is it because, I mean, it feels like in Britain, certainly, um, the Labour Party has had to fit into such a small groove of, of what it will deem to be acceptable by the elites and all the, the different players that they've got to kind of please to get any kind of traction in the marketplace, so to speak. Um, is that what we're seeing around the world or is there something else at play? Yeah, what we're witnessing is not something new. Uh, the German philosopher Walter Benjamin, uh, 100 years ago, almost uh, had a beautiful and most precise uh, uh, definition of this. And he called it the left wing melancholy, uh, the left wing melancholia, uh, uh, where uh, uh, 
he went deeper into the meaning of melancholy, which unlike mourning, uh, melancholy also at least to the definition of Sigmund Freud, is a process in which you cannot get rid of the object which uh, because of which you are suffering or you are sad or it completely changes your life, but you stick to the object, uh, you stick to it uh, even in a way of fetishism, and you constantly revive the object. Uh, I mean, to illustrate the point with, with a pretty banal illustration, uh, uh, you end up with a breakup uh, and then instead of uh, going through the process of uh, uh, letting the person go, uh, you constantly uh, uh, put a knife in your heart by watching old photos, videos or whatever. And in that way, you can never get uh, actually over uh, uh, the object or the subject, uh, which is the source of your suffering. So this is a kind of melancholy. And I would say uh, the left uh, very often suffers from it. Uh, I think the left still didn't uh, uh, recover from the defeats. And there were plenty of defeats, uh, which it suffered in the last decade. Uh, and uh, very often, I would say also one of the reasons uh, for the failure of the left, if you want to put it like that, uh, or for for the absence of uh, a parliamentary success uh, resides in the fact which you mentioned that uh, very often they actually, uh, the left very often, not just because it is pressed by, by, by the material uh, circumstances and foundations of of the system, uh, which already uh, uh, in a way channels you in which way you can act or what you can do at all. Uh, but I think the left uh, uh, is also successful because uh, very often it starts to slide or incline uh, towards the center or towards what Tariq Ali, for instance, called the extreme center. Uh, uh, you best example again is Germany. Uh, where part of the link uh, actually adopted an anti-migration discourse, uh, which surprisingly or not actually uh, gives them a more percentage at at the polls currently, uh, which is interesting as well. But most uh, most of the other cases uh, uh, end up in the following way: the left uh, 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 sees that it's not successful and it starts to incline towards the center in the sense of ideologies, narratives policies and so on, uh, but the voters actually don't want this, but they want a real authentic radical left. Uh, so why would they vote for, 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 for a center left if they can vote for, for a right center, which is very similar to this? Uh, but in any way, I'm kind of bored of this parliamentary politics already. I'm not saying it's not it's not important and uh, people shouldn't be mobilizing and shouldn't be uh, trying to transform political parties or build new political parties. Uh, but uh, me personally, after 20 years of being active in various social movements, even running for European elections in 2019, together with my uh, dear friend Yanis Varoufakis, uh, at the moment I'm just yeah, kind of not that much interested in it because I see that the new energy, that the new theoret theoretical reconceptualizations of, of global capitalism and possible forms of resistance uh, uh, is not com coming from political parties currently, uh, but it's coming as it was very often the case from social social movements. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we would end up in a chicken and the egg situation. Uh, what shall be done? You know, what what to do in this situation where you all have uh, a desire, uh, uh, an urgency to create new political forms, to create new forms of living together, to create new forms of society, uh, uh, and well, my response these days is to just try to reinvent new institutions, if it's possible. Not just uh, what Rudi Dutschke famously, during the period of 68, called the Lange Marsch durch die Institutionen, the long march through the institutions, but at the same time to build uh, new institutions outside of the existing institutions. So that's basically where I am at the moment in the sense of my own aspirations and crossroads <laughs> put it like that yeah i echo that man i mean i, I totally get what you're saying and, and i want to come on to that um in the second part of the conversation to do with what can we do with citizens and activists to kind of affect change outside of this binary ping pong bullshit match that we get to have every four years where we we get to vote for the lesser of two evils if we're lucky to even be able to do that neither of which truly represent 99.9 percent .9 of us anymore um so I think I probably share your sentiments on, on what some of the solutions to that are going to be. But before we get to that point, I want to kind of get a bigger picture of what we're dealing with on, an, on a global scale. So you've mentioned already that you know the power systems around the world and the power structures around the world are changing. You know, we've got a clash of empires now. 
But where does our beloved Europe fit in amongst all of this on the world stage now? Yeah, well, Europe, as you know, is better than ever. Uh, it's shiny weather. Everyone is living uh, the, the life of their dreams, driving electric cars, <laughs> uh, not polluting the rest of the of of, of the universe, uh, not involved anymore in coup d'etats, colonialism, new sorts of imperialism. So we finally <laughs> reached the end of history in Europe. But of course, haha, it's it's a bad joke. Uh, no, I mean I've I've been dealing with 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 Europe for a while uh, uh, back. I think 10 years ago, together with Slava Zizek, uh, we published a book which was per first published in, in, in UK and then later by Columbia University Press. It was called What Does Europe Want? Uh, and it was, you know, it's a paraphrase of this famous question uh, from Sigmund Freud. Freud himself never succeeded to, 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 to come to an answer to this question. Uh, and similarly, I think the question What Does Europe Want also leaves us uh, not with an answer, but just with open questions. Uh, I mean, it's the famous joke, uh, whom, do a, whom do you call if you want to call Europe? And obviously there is no one to call. Uh, uh, I mean, there are unelected representatives, uh, for instance, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, who went uh, to Israel uh, immediately uh, after this uh, last war started, uh, although none of the European citizens decided or had an ask whether this representative should represent us in such a uh, complex uh, uh, and uh, uh, urgent, of course, uh, issue. Uh, not to mention, of course, the European, other European financial institutions and uh, uh, the kind of business they are doing on the periphery of the European Union. Uh, but all in all, I would say the trend of the rise of right-wing populism uh, or even forms of fascism. Uh, I think this uh, rise uh, is happening rapidly. Uh, I mean, it is something me and Zizek have been talking about 10 years ago already and many others as well. Uh, uh, but what we kind of projected at that time 10 years ago is unfortunately something what is happening now, that uh, the further escalation outside of Europe, which means new wars, which means uh, new influx of uh, migrants and refugees. Uh, and, uh, you know, I we were speaking about that 10 years ago. I visited uh, when Idomeni uh, uh, in Greece, you know, this refugee camp with almost 20,000 people uh, on, on the railways. I visited Calais uh, uh, also five years ago or something. And I would say that Idomeni, Calais, these were just small footnotes uh, for what is coming. And we can already see it. Uh, the millions of people displaced because uh, uh, of the war in Ukraine, uh, the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of people uh, displaced already from, the, from, from Gaza, uh, uh, millions of others uh, from Africa, from Asia, who are affected either, either by wars or civil wars or by climate crisis, uh, they're all coming to Europe. Uh, and what we can witness, I can witness it these days in Croatia. Maybe that's a good example to give you, uh, 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 because we didn't have, unlike the United Kingdom, Croatia, for instance. First of all, it wasn't; it, it was never an imperial power, uh, so of course it didn't have uh, colonies, uh, and because of that reason, also we didn't have uh, such an influx of migrants to 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 the space of now what is called post Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, with a small footnote, uh, during the non-aligned movement, of course, Yugoslavia had very good connections with the Global South. And at that time, in the 70s and the 80s, we had people from Africa, Asia and so on coming to study to Belgrade, to Zagreb. Uh, but this situation changed. Uh, it's a very monoculture culture. It's a very white culture. And uh, it's, it's a nation which is dying out. Uh, so only in the last uh, 10, 10 years, uh, Croatia has lost 300,000 people. Uh, who left in search for jobs, uh, mainly to Germany, Austria, and Western Europe. Uh, uh, so at this moment, Croatia has a bit less than 4 million inhabitants. Uh, the projection is that in the next seven years, uh, 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 more than half a million of migrant workers will arrive to Croatia, uh, which means that a huge percentage of uh, uh, the population will be non-Croatians. Uh, and at the same time, the statistical projections, demographic projections say that until 2100, uh, Croatia will only have 2 million inhabitants. And now, of course, that's, that sounds 
uh, uh, ridiculous. I mean, to 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 be from Croatia, to be speaking from Croatia as I am today, uh, from a country which is becoming as a kind of uh, reservoir, you know, like a zoo, uh, in the sense that uh, the, the 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 Croatian white uh, class, uh, who was never imperial, of course, and is not that privileged as the West, is now pretty privileged to those people who are coming. There are no integration policies. Uh, for instance, I was a kid of a still am of a political refugee. So I lived as a refugee in Germany in the 80s. Uh, uh, very soon when we came, my father got a free language course by Goethe Institute for six months. Uh, if you come from Nepal, Bangladesh, that's mainly the countries where the migrants come from to Croatia these days. Uh, there is no free language course to learn Croatia. There is no integration. So what is happening in the last year is literally every day in the newspaper we read about a new racist attack uh, and of course that might not be new to you although i would say that the the, the level the the statistics the amount of these attacks is really astonishing uh, and uh, it's something which points into a very bleak future not just for croatia but for europe as such uh, because obviously because of climate crisis uh, but also obviously the war because uh, war is the permanent state and peace, unfortunately, is just a pose. Uh, uh, because of the war and climate crisis, we can definitely expect uh, the numbers exponentially to rise, that we will have hundreds of millions of refugees, uh, of course, trying to reach Europe, at least at the beginning, while it's still not completely fucked by climate crisis. Uh, and uh, Europe responding in the way which we could have seen during the last 10 years, uh, either by outsourcing, uh, the refugee crisis at the beginning, you know, they outsourced it to Greece, to Idomeni. A few months ago, I don't know if you saw that, uh, Italy and Albania made the deal that it will outsource their refugees to Albania, who is now building detention camps for migrants, uh, uh, where around 30 or 40,000 uh, refugees will be based in Albania. So they are trying to escape war from, let's say, Afghanistan, pass through Greece, uh, pay thousands of euros. Uh, uh, to smugglers, uh, then they are deported back, they go back and they go back. And in the end, you know, they arrive to Italy and then they will deport them to Albania. So on the one hand, what we can follow is this outsourcing of the refugee crisis, uh, which also acquires very dystopian science fiction characteristics. For instance, that boat uh, in the United Kingdom, which is a floating uh, refugee detention camp. So you don't even need a country anymore. You can just put them on boats. Uh, uh, so more and more, we are coming closer to Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men, uh, uh, where, you know, refugees are in cages and Europe is completely divided. So on the one hand, I think this outsourcing of, of refugees will become an even harder problem. What we could have seen in the last 10 years, and that points towards the next 10 years, is that uh, the building of walls, electric fences, artificial intelligence is already being used by Frontex, uh, that these technological advances using traditional like walls, but using also modern forms of technology like artificial intelligence, that that will also rapidly rise. Uh, we've seen it already in Hungary and with the regime of Orban, uh, he already built a wall. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, Frontex, which is this migration uh, army to call them like that of the official army of the european union uh, is getting equipped with all this ai technology uh, which is now also being tested uh, in gaza for instance uh, in which way through the machine and technology uh, you can uh, scan people you can influence their behavior you can block them of uh, entering uh, public transport uh, you can make their lives miserable so uh, at one point i think even the passport will not mean that much anymore although at least for us who are still privileged it still means everything uh, but i think the the, the 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 kind of control which is coming the kind of biopolitics which is coming to europe uh, uh, given the state of things uh, given uh, uh, this Whole situation which we just painted um, is of course something which should worry us all uh, because I, I you know you don't have to be a weatherman to know in which direction the wind will flow uh, it's sufficient to look at the last almost 20 years uh, since the financial crisis 2007 2008 and in from in which way from that moment uh, the European Union although it had you know some new accession Croatia was uh, was the last accession member state uh, uh it's imploding it's imploding when it comes to the demography it's a continent which is dying out 
you, you've seen it with this little statistics about Croatia, but we could talk about other countries where fertility is going down. That's why I say it's a children of men scenario. At the same time, Europe is involved in uh, wars uh, uh, across the world, which, like a boomerang, is coming back to Europe. Uh, for instance, you know, the last year or even more, we are using fracked gas from the United States now. Uh, uh, but oil, at the same time, comes from Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries. Uh, at the same time, the standard of people living in Europe is rapidly falling down. Uh, just look at Germany, which is entering recession, where you have huge farmers' protests. Uh, uh, you know, if these things are happening in Germany, uh, which, as we know, is the core of the European Union, uh, is the foundation of the European Union, uh, uh, together with France, but Germany was always the most important country. If Germany is hitting such a crisis, if Alternative für Deutschland, this far-right Nazi party, uh, is uh, uh, rising that much in the polls that it's uh, putting a shadow on all the other parties, and it's the Europe's elite's fault uh, to 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 be leading us in this direction, uh, which can just mean further escalation. Uh, it can also mean terrorism back home, uh, because whatever happens in the Middle East, or in Africa, or in Asia, uh, as a rule, will return like a boomerang uh, to the European Union as well. We had it already in the past, uh, uh, and it's just a matter of time when we will have it in the future, yes. Ah, oh, man, that's a pretty bleak prognosis for the near future then, you know? Um, Please, you asked you ask for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because like you say, you know, knowledge is power. You know, we, we need to know that the storm is coming so that we can prepare and navigate accordingly, you know? So, yeah, no, it's no good pretending this shit ain't happening. And you mentioned AI there, and that's great because I was actually going to ask you about that because we know that all of the dubious ways that power is going to use AI against us as a weapon and as a means of control. But is there any potential, do you think, that AI and the coming uh, advancements in like Web3 and decentralized web could actually benefit activists and provide some kind of asset to us as dissenters, you know, in terms of proliferation of information or building networks or organizing? Is there that capacity, do you think, or is this just another tool for the billionaire club to keep the peasants down? I mean, the technology, of course, is always uh, a pharmacon. Uh, as Plato called it, uh, in the sense that uh, it depends in which way you use it. Uh, uh, but we are at, at the current stage, uh, uh, artificial intelligence is completely out of the developments, uh, advances in artificial intelligence, or to be more precise in machine learning, uh, are completely out of control. Uh, 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 we don't have any influence uh, and experts also who are in this field also don't have any influence in which way it is being developed. So. Of course, we should be worried. Of course, we should be worried because what we are reaching now, uh, I think, is the not the final phase, but 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 a tipping point in the phase of the advances of technology. Uh, 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 why uh, the, the the German philosopher who is unfortunately pretty forgotten now, although uh, his outdated outdatedness of of of, of the human being uh, will be published very soon in English. Uh, uh, Günther Anders uh, had a thesis that exactly in this book uh, that uh, uh, the humans became outdated uh, uh, because we are not an historical in the sense that it is the humans who make history, but we are becoming co-historical in the sense that it's technology which is making history. Uh, Günther Anders wrote this half a century ago, influenced by Hirsch. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he was really ahead of his time. Uh, uh, and he was writing this mainly in the context of nuclear uh, technology, in the sense that we succeeded to create uh, such a thing, which as long as human civilization will exist, even if it's one hour, hour more, or 100 days more, 100 years, or 100 centuries, we will be unable to unlearn the tech technology which we invented. So the nuclear threat will always remain with us, whatever we do, even if suddenly there is peace in the world, which, of course, we know uh, remains a, a Kantian utopian idea and, of course, an aspiration of many of us who are still utopian. Uh, uh, but even if we arrive at the stage of world peace, uh, which, as you know, is pretty unimaginable, uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to unlearn the technology we, we had uh, uh, invented. And I think I think the same goes uh, for artificial intelligence. Uh, another term which I think is also very useful, again, comes from Günther Anders, uh, who said that uh, what we are witnessing with the development of technology 
is something what he calls the Promethean gap, uh, which means that we are not able to understand the repercussions of our own inventions. We are not able to understand what kind of consequences our inventions will have. Uh, uh, and of course, it goes for any invention. Uh, I mean, when the first wheel was invented, uh, probably it wasn't invented uh, with the idea that you could have a tank uh, in uh, several thousand years later, but it was invented for carrying uh, wood or or whatever. Uh, uh, but the same goes for artificial intelligence, which is, of course, even more dangerous uh, than the wheel, for instance, uh, because we really cannot understand the, the consequences of this technology. What we can understand at this moment uh, 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 is that it's certainly another phase in monopoly capitalism, uh, uh, in the sense that you already have a few Silicon Valley companies uh, who are uh, uh, in occupying the space of technology, at least of the Western world, including Europe then. Uh, uh, and what you will have now is even further stages of hyper integration of uh, the uh, the penetration into all spheres of life, which then to come back to your question, of course, will af affect activists, social movements, uh, because uh, uh, already now the European Union has registers of activists, uh, but then you can imagine to what stage it would come uh, when you apply machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, I mean, what comes first to my mind is uh, Philip K. Dick and Minority Report, or the movie which might be a bit more famous because it's by Steven Spielberg and uh, Tom Cruise, uh, uh, the science fiction scenario in which the police uh, actually solves pre-crimes. Uh, so even before you yourself know that you will commit a crime, the state, or in the, in our situation, it might also be a corporation, because this is also more and more being outsourced to corporations. In the same way, NHS uh, is now in power of, uh, power is now in power of the NHS. In the same way, you know, the police might be uh, a Tesla's police or Zuckerberg's police or whoever. So it's being outsourced, uh, uh, I think, as well. And of course, this should, this should worry us. I mean, what we can see in Gaza these days is in which way uh, uh, they are already uh, using AI in drones, uh, but in order to affect civilian population. And this is the problem of technology, you know, that uh, uh, the same problem with nuclear, nuclear technology. I know for years already, Israeli corporations have been using uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence in drone in drone uh, operations uh, for agriculture. Uh, and then you can see that, of course, there is the step from using AI and drones in agriculture to using AI and drones in killing people. This step is very small. Uh, in the same way, the step uh, from uh, using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes to using nuclear energy for uh, war purposes uh, uh, is also very small. Uh, and uh, so in this sense, I definitely don't belong to these techno-optimists, techno-fetishists who think, yeah, it's sufficient to find a new technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, geoengineering, terraforming or whatever, and this will be the solution for, for all our problems. Uh, no, I think we have to go much deeper. We have to go into the structural uh, uh, systemic uh, foundations of our very system, which is producing uh, uh, technology in that way, which is producing inequalities, which is actually uh, laying the grounds for the final destruction of the planet as we as we know it. Wow. Man. Well, I think that's probably a perfect point to jump off and talk about what the hell can we do about this stuff? Because we've clearly got some massive challenges and obstacles ahead, as well as a rapidly shifting terrain in which to operate. So what are your thoughts? Because I know that you're very active in these areas and you've got a lot of things that you're involved in. What are your thoughts on what we can do as the 99% to steer things in a different direction, if at all possible? I mean, of course, I don't have a recipe what we can do. It's a question Lenin asked 100 years ago. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, uh, through the last 100 years, there have been plenty of uh, recipes or proposals. I mean, from Hart and Neg, uh, Empire and Multitude. Unfortunately, Negril also left us recently uh, to uh, Chantal Mou's populism, to... Uh, various others proposals in which way, or Andreas Malm, for instance, uh, how to blow up a pipeline. 
So you can see there are various proposals which range from building a mass movement to building up or transforming a political party to creating a successful narrative which would be able to inspire people. And then we even go to more radical actions, uh, uh, which uh, is, uh, well, violence, which is attacking the sources, the foundations of the uh, capitalist machine. Uh, uh, and if you look at it, you know, this, I'm, this is just out of my head, uh, painting a possible landscape which exists today. Of course, we could then speak about the Labour Party and what kind of problems the Labour Party has, but I'm not really... Uh, ready to ruin my morning by going into that story or yours. Uh, uh, so we could of course speak about the impotence of existing political parties. What went what went wrong? Uh, in which way the enemy actually is even more successful by creating narratives about uh, those in the party who actually like Corbyn who wanted uh, a radical change, uh, and then all these accus accusations of anti-Semitism uh, and so on. So this is something everyone will fa will face at one moment. Uh, when you are powerful enough to 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 bring things in questions, this is something what Julian Assange faced as well. Uh, this sort of character assassination, which of course uh, had all the characteristics from rape to anti-Semitism to him being a Russian spy to him being annoying to him riding a skateboard at the Ecuadorian embassy, even such bizarre things and ridiculous things, uh, which were all here to show that he is a, a problematic guy whom you shouldn't like. Uh, and that's what happened in various ways to Jer Jeremy Corbyn. That's also what happened on the European level uh, to, to, to a big degree also to Yanis Varoufakis when he was finance minister of Greece. Uh, you know, they will really attack you with all the arsenal they have. Uh, and uh, that's, in a way, as well, I think, hopeful, if you want, uh, because it shows that uh, uh, that uh, at some point the left actually has a possibility to 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 bring uh, power in question. Uh, you can see it by these harsh attacks, actually, but you could also see it by by various experiences, uh, so also recent ones, for instance, in. Colombia with Gustavo Petro, his stance on geopolitics, for instance, you could see that even in some parts of the world, the left is in power, of course. Uh, uh, but that's that's party politics. And you ask me what we could do. Of course, uh, uh, I've been involved both in, in social movements, mainly in social movements, organizing, uh, but also political parties. I think our first starting point uh, should be twofold. On the one hand, uh, of course, it's internationalism. I think uh, we are doomed without internationalism, especially in a situation where capital is international, the banks are international, our enemies are pretty well connected on the international level. Uh, and that's also the reason why I'm involved in an organization which is called the Progressive International, which is actually trying to recreate not just the spirit of new international internationalism, but the conditions of uh, further internationalist cooperation uh, 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 between the North and the South and the East and, and, and all sides of the world. Uh, but as I said, our starting point should be twofold. I think on the one hand, it's internationalism. On the other hand, it has to be locally grounded. On the other hand, you can't just be, I've seen many people like that, you know, an international traveler who goes from a protest to protest, from a conference to a conference, from a World Social Forum to a World Social Forum, and so on. Uh, but back at his or her community, that person is not actually contributing much. Uh, so I think uh, uh, at the same time, besides internationalism and trying to be connected as much as we can, even uh, uh, a person who is not, you know, in this kind of world, try to be connected with people outside of your milieu, outside of your country. Uh, uh, that's on the simplest level. But of course, what we have to do, who are, let's say, professional activists, to, to call it like that, is to build uh, deeper connections and relations within this multitude, if you want to, to, to call it like that. But unless we are able uh, to build uh, different relations of care, different relations of love, different relations of solidarity, friendship, uh, on the local level, in our communities, in the building in which you are living, in the city in which you are living, in the country in which you are living, then I think also internationalism is uh, uh, also insufficient. Uh, which brings me to this anecdote, I think, I read it first time by, by, by Tari, at Tariq Ali, who said that at one point uh, the Italian communists uh, came to, to Vietnam to meet Ho Chi Minh, 
And after two hours of a talk where Ho Chi Minh complained about the situation, uh, they asked him, okay, so comrade, uh, what can we do? And he said, pack your things and go back to Italy. Uh, uh, because the biggest help you can give us is to make a revolution in Italy. Uh, and I think this is something what internationalists should have in mind, you know, unless we are also able to change the, the material conditions of politics, economy and society in our own societies, uh, then we also won't be able to do it on the international level. So we need a dialectics between these. Uh, but more and more, I also think that what we should be aiming at, and it's not, I have to warn you immediately, it's not an anarchist, escapist dream, is to try to experiment by building uh, uh, new social institutions, by building autonomous spaces and autonomous temporalities, uh, which are not outside global capitalism, because there is no outside of global capitalism. You can even travel to Mars and you will find Elon Musk's uh, shit there, you know, uh, in an electric compost toilet or whatever. Uh, 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 so there is no outside. But what we can do is to build parallel institutions, parallel forms of life, parallel forms of being together, parallel forms of uh, political, economical, societal uh, formations, uh, which would be able uh, at the same time to transform us before the revolution, before a political party comes to power, before a petition, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and at the same time uh, would enable us to lead a good life. Uh, I think that's the, I mean, that's the most burning question. I, I, it's, it's, which is on my mind, but also on many others with whom I talk, for instance, Franco Berardi, Bifo, who is involved in the School of Autonomy on this. It is not just how do we survive these times? Uh, 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 because mere survival is not enough. I'm not interested in just what many people, unfortunately, are uh, condemned to these days, millions and billions, you know, a bare life where you are forced to just search for food, shelter, protection, water, and peace. Uh, 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 so I know that for many people, the very question of good life is a privileged question, I would say. Uh, but I, I would say that posing the question about good life in extinction, in times of extinction, is crucial. Why? First of all, it's a question which is old as philosophy. Uh, what is good life goes back to the question, what is good? Uh, 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 good in the sense of ethics, good in the sense of a morality, something which is, of course, completely unpopular today. Who even cares about morality or ethics or whatever, or good? Uh, so it's connected to a sort of ethics. So when we speak about good life, it's not that much about uh, hedonism, about uh, you know just sitting on a beach, reading a good book, and not caring about the rest of the world, uh, which of course people should be doing all as well, and it should be a human right to do things like that and completely switch off. But again, it's a privilege. Uh, but good life in the sense of ethical life, how? For instance, if you take this example, even if I sit on a beach, read a book while I know that atrocities are happening, uh, how can this reflect a deeper ethics or morality uh, which uh, uh, is not castrating me from doing from time to time some things which every human should be doing, uh, uh, but could actually uh, 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 be integrated in a broader moral uh, uh, moral value system uh, which would then advocate also for others to have the same possibility to do the same. So in the sense, in this sense, good life is not simply that you have a good life and I have another shelter. Uh, I mean, that's for me, that's not good life. Uh, uh, definitely, I'm not interested in, in, in post-apocalyptic shelters. I would say good life is how can we in the first place prevent such situation? How can we, instead of having dreams of escaping to Mars and terraform, how can we actually start forming the Earth itself? Uh, by diminishing poverty, by diminishing inequality, by diminishing racism, colonialism, imperialism, and the never-ending extraction and expansion of global capitalism. I think that's the question. So uh, I think it's to, to, to come to my final point, what should be done? Yes, of course, someone should, I'm not opposed to it, uh, try to infiltrate political parties or build new political parties and you know, you must do this for 10, 10 years, 20 years or 30 years in order to maybe come to power. Sometimes there are shortcuts, but usually not. Uh, on the other hand, you could and you should be active in social movements. And I'm active in social movements as well. 
But I think we should all start posing these big questions, uh, which are questions, as I said, older than 3,000 years, uh, but they're relevant again, and we have to pose it in a new co- in a new context. We have to pose it in a new way, which uh, uh, which is uh, uh, part precisely of our today's poly crisis and the situation that we have multiple crises at the same time: climate crisis, war, nuclear annihilation, migration, and so on. Brilliant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, in a way, it's that kind of saying, isn't it? Of like, you know, think globally, act locally. I mean, yes, of course, we all need to be educated and informed about what's happening on a global scale because a lot of problems are, are global problems now, certainly the climate. And we live in a world now where everything is connected. You know, when, whatever happens, one side of the, of, the, of the earth affects all of us. So we need to be globally informed. But at the same time, you know, we can take control of what's happening in our local communities and in our backyard and on our doorstep. That's something we can actually do something about on a daily basis. We can take control of our own communities. We can get involved in our, the solutions to our own problems. And there's so much we can do together right here, right now, that can have massive impacts because, as I said, everything is connected these days. So in a way, I derive some hope from that because despite the kind of unfathomable existential threats that we're facing right now, certainly in terms of the climate and the threat of nuclear war, there are things we can do about stuff that makes a big difference. And it is difficult to feel hopeful in the current environment and for very good reason. But I wanted to ask, do you feel hopeful? Are you hopeful for the future? Despite everything that you've talked about in this conversation so far, are you hopeful for the future that we can turn it around? And if so, what fuels that hope? Yeah, I'm usually not someone who likes the, the, the concept of hope. <laughs> I, previously, I did. Previously I did, but I think I, I've read too much Kafka in my life that he ruins <laughs> any prospects of hope. No. <laughs> no, and I think it's it's Kafka or it's Benjamin, I don't know anymore, who says that the Messiah will come the day after he's needed, you know. <laughs> this is the kind of philosophy I like. <laughs> Fuck the Messiah. Don't wait for the Messiah. Uh, uh, be determined. Uh, you know, that's my problem with hope. Hope is more like um, imagination optimism, uh, waiting for something to happen, wishing for something to happen. And nothing is wrong with that. I mean, I, I very often have various imaginations of things to happen. And of course, you need to have a dream or a utopia or a desire which leads you towards somewhere. And even if you don't achieve it on the path, if you're lucky enough, you will realize that you actually found something, whatever, which is close or different from that to which you were aspiring. Uh, uh, but I think Faced with our global planetary crisis, what we need is not hope. Uh, we need determination. We need organization and we need self-organization. Uh, Terry Eagleton had a beautiful term. Uh, he called it hope without optimism. Uh, maybe that's, if we want to keep the term hope, maybe that's more precise uh, because there is no reason for optimism. And I think we've seen it so many times already. I mean, maybe I'm getting old, uh, but, you know, this kind of investment of libidinal like energy into for instance a success of a political party uh you know you have so much hope that you know corbyn or alexis Tsipras will be the messiah finally but i said you know fuck the messiah you, you know that the, the very concept of politics where you wait for a messiah is wrong in the start uh, which doesn't mean that we don't need charismatic individuals it doesn't mean that we don't need people who can take a lead at a certain point in a certain field uh, but this awaiting of a messiah of a solution which will come from the sky and suddenly lead us out of the land of tears i think that's precisely what is wrong with hope uh, so instead of that i think yeah we need determination organizing and self-organizing fuck the messiah that's the quote i'm going to use from the episode <laughs> I get it, I like it. Yeah. just don't tell it to the messiah because maybe he maybe he comes the day before he was supposed to come <laughs> And then I fuck it up, you know. Finally, he was supposed to come, but then he heard, fuck the Messiah. Uh, <laughs> Stresko Horvath fucks it up for humanity. You would love that, dude, wouldn't you? You, you and your, all your Kafkaesque perversion, you would love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think it's time. we got to take a rapid curveball here, dude, because I'm mindful of the time, and I've got to ask you about this, because I think this is something that many of your fans and followers will not know about you, perhaps. But you have a background in punk rock. We share that in common, man. So tell me more. What's the deal with Stretchko Horvat and punk rock? Well, I'm not like you. I'm not. Uh, I'm definitely not anymore. But never been a professional or successful musician. You know, 
I was just a kid. I think it all started, I think, in 1992, which God sounds like uh, the dinosaur time. Uh, I sound like a boomer now. Uh, anyhow, it was Croatia, Yugoslavia was collapsing. Uh, the war was happening, of course. And a cousin of mine came from Germany and brought this CD uh, with a bold guy who is burning in a fire. And then in a typewriter font, you have written down rage against the machine. And I think that was 92 or 93. And I was nine or 10 years old. And it completely changed my life, completely. So before then, you know, at school, because that was the time of war, we were all reading, uh, we were all learning these patriotic Croatian songs, uh, which were, you know, I mean, I don't even want to begin. Pretty ridiculous, but this typical kind of ideological re-education, which comes with a new state and so on. And for me, this hardcore punk, let's call it like that, was an exit from the madness of war, from the madness of nationalism. Uh, I was not even yet a teenager. But then I remember after I heard the first track, which was Bomb Track, uh, uh, it really changed my life. It was like, what the fuck is this? You know, as if some alien came and gave me uh, 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 a CD from 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 Jupiter or whatever. Uh, and then slowly, it was still a problem then in our landscape. We, you know, we were in the period of transition from socialism to capitalism. So you didn't have the free market yet in the way we have it today. You didn't have that many Western products. And it was really, you know, a problem how to find new music. And I think that that was actually, for me, one of the best lessons I've learned for the future of my life, because that was the beginning of self-organization, you know. Uh, it was sufficient that one kid went to Germany, brought one CD, and, you know, we would dub it in hundreds of copies and everyone would have, have a tape with it. Then I think at the mid-90s, because I knew German uh, and the internet just came, I think that was the time, yeah, 95, 96 or something, we got our first personal computer at home. And I started to write to bands I liked. I even wrote the biggest ones at that time was System of a Down. I wrote a letter and I received I received a demo tape, I think, which is like, which was 90, 98 or something like that. So I wrote even to big bands who were not big then. Refused, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we were big fans of Refused. And they all, always responded. I was like 12, wow. kid or whatever, you know, just starting high school. And for wow, me, that was, again, a ticket into a parallel universe. It was a way to hack my way out of ex-Yugoslavia, torn by war and nationalism and turbo capitalism. Uh, it was a way to also, at a very early age, get a push from... That's why I think what you are doing is so important, you know, to, to, to get a push from those people whom I uh, admire. Uh, you know, I was like 12 or 13. There was someone who was 16 or 18 and already had a band, toured around Europe, publishing a fanzine, had some views on the world, on vegetarianism, ecology, whatever, capitalism, was reading Chomsky and so on. And that's how I actually started to really have my first political subjectivation. And then a bit later, I started a band. Uh, it was new school, hardcore, uh, Krishna core, snap case, this kind of new school stuff very emotional but also very like metallic and so on and we had yeah a few concerts even played with converge that was our biggest concert wow. in you know converge of course yeah yeah hell yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah, awesome yeah. I'm, I'm so happy i mean that i had this experience of hardcore punk it's still in me and i think it's it's really something which how to put it it was unlike many other subcultures uh it was really a don't know where it is today uh, but the best way for political subjectivation, uh, because all the kind of literature uh, from anarchism, Marxism, critique of capitalism was coming from there, from fanzines we were reading. I mean, I'm talking now about the 90s, uh, before the Internet then took over and then many of these publications didn't exist anymore. Uh, we were organizing our own concerts uh, and, you know, you, you were in a band, you know how, what kind of logistical sophistication you need sometimes and patience in order to put five people in a van, not to mention more, uh, to travel from one town to the other to organize oh, one con. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know very well. Uh, and I think this experience is very useful, was I think, very useful later in life when I was organizing, you know, political or philosophical events for one or 2,000 people. And I already had it in my guts, you know, don't, it wasn't something, wow, science fiction, you know, we've been organizing crazier stuff, if you want, with punk hardcore. And then, of course, I think the most important thing is the sense of community, uh, the sense of belonging, the sense of uh, uh, 
being together with like-minded people, uh, uh, having the same worries, the same troubles, whether it comes to first love affairs or family troubles, uh, to the state of the world and the state of the planet. And this sense of belonging, I think, is uh, really crucial. And it's really something which I still still carry in me, not in a nostalgic way, but in a way that I'm trying to become more and more aware in which way this experience of hardcore punk actually formed me as as a person later beautiful to hear man yeah i love that i love that and very very similar journey mate to be honest i mean like rage against the machine was was one of my founding <laughs> moments i mean for me it was a cassette a cassette copy you know we had like it was like it was like drugs you know we would we were handing these copied cassettes around like illicit goods you know for in case our parents or teachers found out about it you know what i mean and it just i remember listening to it for the first time it just hearing killing in the name of i was like what you can say that you know we're all thinking it but he's saying it you know it's fucking brilliant i just the music and it just ignited something in me of just like possibility that 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 rebel spirit that kind of defiance was 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 okay you know you can even better than okay it was fucking awesome and you could say it loud and proud and um just an amazing amazing band you know they they really changed the game but i mean you know going back further than that as well as as we all do then once once you discover something like you you go digging you know going back to the clash or, or like the diy early days of punk you know that punk ethos of fanzines and you know flyering on the streets and graffiti and you know stenciling your clothes and stuff like that that diy ethos just really really resonated with me and it was the political aspect of it as well you know the anti-authoritarianism the the anti-mainstream the 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 communal aspect of it it was just a real fucking molotov cocktail that went off inside of me you know at at a young age and still very much informs my politics and my way of doing things now you know i was when i couldn't get a record deal when i started out you know I, i i just fucking set up my own label i went punk rock i did it diy and release my own stuff and I've been doing it that way ever since you know that's kind of the model that 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 I that I live by now you know so yeah very much informed musically politically and uh, in terms of how I handle my career as a musician very much I owe everything to, to, to the punk rock ethos and it really felt like a movement back then as well it felt like it was powerful you know what I mean no, I mean, it was. I mean, the, just the fact that the kids, I mean, where, where were you exactly growing up? In which which city? Uh, Cardiff. How big is Cardiff? Pfft, small, I don't know, like half a million people, something like that. Yeah, talking, but I mean, we don't even have a city with a million people in Croatia, so that's rather big. <laughs> I'm probably miles away, dude. I, I'll have to check. Don't, don't, don't quote me on anything. <laughs> yeah, you should, because they will not let you in back to your hometown after this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I lived in Chakovic, which was like 20,000 20, people. And I think when you said, yeah, it was, oh, it was definitely a movement. You know, if a kid in Cardiff and a kid in Chakovic, you know, a kid in capitalism and a kid after socialism had the same kind of entrance into this world, uh, then it shows, uh, of course, I think the power of this movement and the fact that even today we talk about it, uh, that even today many of these bands exist. I mean, think of it all to, I don't know, they still play and it's funny sometimes to see it. Yeah. But it's cool. I like it. Yeah, what what's funny, man, is that um, I got two guys in my band who are like twenty one or twenty two or something like that, um, and they turn up to band practice in Rage Against the Machine t shirts and Nirvana t shirts and stuff like that. And I, you know, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's a beautiful thing because that was a great time for music when it was authentic before everything got fucking complicated when the internet came along and stuff like that. And I, I when I when I see guys that age of that generation still digging that music and wearing those t shirts, it, it really makes me proud, you know, because it's like to see that music living on is really heartening you know what i mean yeah no i love that as well yeah yeah i think once we should just take one hour and just talk about hardcore punk (laughs) (laughs) and not just depress people with war (laughs) climate change everything is shit and so on but a bit more (laughs) yeah of this dude i'm game for that conversation anytime you want man uh but what's the uh what's the music scene like in croatia then these days i have no idea to be honest I really have no idea. I mean, I, I, I now lead a, let's say, family life. Don't go out that much. We're building the school on the island. There is no hardcore punk scene on the island because it's very remote. So rarely we even have concerts. So to be honest, I, I really don't know. I know, I mean, there is a rich musical scene, which is, you know, everything. And they are, you know, different genres and the cant authors and songwriters and so on. And it's pretty rich and so on. But I just don't follow 
that's what I would love to change. I don't follow music that much. Uh, uh, just like I did before. That's maybe a bad thing. So you send me some links and some suggestions, and I'm yeah. glad to, to. Yeah. Yeah. Please, no joke. Please. I'll do better than educate that. Educate me. Educate. Me. You play a concert. You you play a concert for me. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. One. Yeah, I'm down for it, man. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do a trade. You can send me some book recommendations for all those clever dudes you mentioned earlier, and I'll send you some music. And, and I'll I'll do better than that. I'll send you old school ninety style. I'll send you some CDs. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Amazing. It's a fair fair deal. There we go. Done. Um, but well, I I know I'm I'm keeping you a little bit over time, but we've got to talk about the island. So can we can we quickly explain to the listeners what is going on on the island of Viz? What are you guys up to down there? Yeah, I mean, for those who don't know Viz, uh, how to explain Viz? Uh, uh, right. Yeah, Viz, but, but, but no, you pronounce it well. But I'm just like trying to think because it's yeah, it's a remote island. You would have had to take a ship, which takes a bit more than two hours uh, from Split, uh, and uh, it's in the middle of the Adriatic Sea. It had a rich history. It was the first polis founded by the ancient Greeks, so the first city-state uh, in this part of the Adriatic. Uh, later, all sorts of... The Brits also at one point came. And then in the 40s, it was crucial because when Europe was occupied by the Nazis, uh, this was the only liberated territory in this part of Europe. So it was never occupied by the Nazis. And in fact, Tito, uh, the leader of the anti-fascist movement of Yugoslavia, was operating from a cave, uh, from a, uh, from Vis. And some 10 or 15 minutes walk from this cave on the top of the island, uh, we are building a school, uh, and it's called Isa, which is also the name of the first police uh, two and a half thousand years ago. It was called Isa. Uh, but for us, uh, we use it as an acronym, uh, which stands for Island School of Social Autonomy. And uh, among the co-founders of this project are the artists, Media Group Bitnik, my dear friend, actor Gael Garcia Bernal, but also Pamela Anderson, Franco Berardi Bifo, uh, Hito Sterl. So we have from philosophers, actors to practitioners. Uh, and the idea is basically to build a hybrid model. And I think that's the only model uh, which still makes sense of education, uh, which is set in the nature, which is set on an island. Uh, which is then uh, in a landscape which itself is surreal, although it's changing also uh, due to climate crisis, uh, uh, and uh, at the same time to combine theory and practice. Uh, so, for instance, the, the main aim is to respond and reflect upon the question how is it possible to create uh, levels of autonomy and good life today? Uh, 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 so we are doing philosophical reflections on it, but at the same time we are trying to prototype it in a way in reality. So through the last two years, we've been reconstructing. We did it, but now there is still much more work to do. Uh, 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 an old water tank, which is a kind of method which was being used since the time of the Greeks. Uh, so more than 2000 years ago, which is the method of dry stone walls. In the case of the water tank, you have piles of stones. And then the rainwater is collected, slides through the stones, and it's collected collected in a water tank. Uh, anyhow, we 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 learned about this traditional method from the locals, from the island. We learn a lot from the people on the island, which you could call a sort of indigenous knowledge, although the term wouldn't be used here in Croatia. But it is because it's a knowledge which goes back to uh, to the Greeks, to the Illyrians, to the Romans. What trying to do is to combine this traditional method with the modern method of collecting rain, which is cloud collectors card. We have to experiment with it. Or for instance, this summer we were experimenting with a pirate radio station. Uh, so we got the equipment uh, and uh, we succeeded to cover the whole island with our signal. And wow. basically the idea that, that with this, with yeah, maybe next time you can come do your podcast from there. <laughs> yeah. Be oh, with, a better, yeah, with a better view, with a better view. Hell uh, yeah. Better, Hell, better weather for sure, man. Yeah. Better weather, definitely. Yeah. But the <laughs> thing is, you know, how this, with this kind of prototypes, we could actually build something uh, which responds to the question of autonomy, but also good life, and which, which is the most important thing, could be translated into different contexts. So, for instance, what we are doing on Wii is the idea is that these kind of things could be done and very often are already being done. We are not the first ones in other places of the world. And the idea is in which way the aspiration is to share this knowledge, 
uh, to also start working on creating a network of similar projects across the world uh, uh, who are doing stuff like this. And for this year, I think, yeah, we're organizing plenty of activities. Uh, uh, from spring onwards, we are most of the time on the island. And then I think in October, we will have our annual event. Uh, yeah, I think after summer. But during summer and uh, other months, we are involved in a lot of physical action, carrying a lot of material, building, constructing, learning uh, from the islanders themselves and doing little, little public programs. Uh, and then in October, we plan to do a big one. So I don't know, I'm very bad uh, at promotion, but if you want to find out more, go to issaschool.org, uh, ISA school, and you can find out more information. Absolutely fascinating, man. What an incredible thing to be involved in. Um, the website, I'll put a link in the show notes so that people can click on it direct. It is issa-school.org. And you'll notice in the top right-hand corner, there's the very important button that says donate because the guys are doing this, you know, on, on, on their own budget and donations to fund this incredible project would be very, very well received, I'm sure. Yeah, that, that would be really helpful because we are still running only on our funds. So we don't have any any funds basically, and we depend. We yeah. If anyone can donate a little, you see, I'm very bad at this. But if you can can donate at least ten thousand or twenty, we would really be grateful. Yeah, <laughs> fuck ten, <laughs> ten thousand, not ten. <laughs> Well, get on it, guys. I'll put the link in, right? Um, I'll give it a plug as well. After after the conversation, I'll drop that. I'll drop that in the edit. Um, see if we can get some shekels for the project because uh, you're doing amazing work down there. Uh, Shretchko, I'm, I'm aware that I've kept you over time. I better let you go. But thanks so much for this amazing, fascinating, and inspiring conversation. You're doing amazing work. And please keep doing what you're doing. And hopefully, we'll get to um, share a beer at some point, you know, um, later on in the year, perhaps. Yeah, I hope so. I hope to see you on the island. And don't forget the deal we had. CDs for <laughs> books. <laughs> CDs for Stretch Co. I got it. Okay, got thanks it. a lot. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> no, thank you, man. Thank you. Take care, dude. See you thank soon. Thank you. I really enjoyed Me Bye. too. Best Bye-bye. wishes, bro. See you, man. Stretch Co. Hold that. And he's gone. What a dude. Man, that conversation. I'm still reeling from that, to be honest. It's going to take me a little bit of time to process everything that dude was 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 throwing at me there. Um, what a conversation. There's so much stuff in there to go and uh, dig into. I think that's going to warrant a second or third listen, I think. What a guy. What a cool dude. What a brain. What a mind that guy has got. And what amazing work he's doing as well. So let's 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 plug those links before we all forget. The school he was just talking about on the island of Vis is iwsa-school.org. Please donate. I know he was joking, saying about twenty grand, but <laughs> if you got twenty grand, chuck it in. But honestly, every little helps with these things. You know, it's like a lot of people giving a little bit of change really makes a massive difference. That kind of ties in with what we were talking about earlier, I think. So please, you know, if you can spare a little something for the incredible work these guys are doing, please donate a little something. But if you can't, get involved in other ways. Man, check out the website for sure. It's a really fascinating and interesting thing that they're doing down there. And more than that. You need to follow Stretchko Horvat because that dude is doing a lot of cool stuff. He's a busy guy. He's got a load of books that you can tuck into and a load of content and interviews and videos and things like that. So dive into his world, educate yourself and help and support and amplify that dude in any way you can because he, he's, he's a great guy, man. His Twitter handle is Horvat Stretchko. Uh, the spelling of that is going to throw you off. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just put the link in the uh, in the in the show notes there. Please give it a click. Give him a follow. It's not hard to do, is it? And uh, you're going to see some super cool stuff in your newsfeed. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Thank you so much for listening. And before I go, one more nag. You know what I'm going to say? Subscribe to the goddamn podcast. Lots more of this good stuff are coming. Do not miss out, man. I'll be back in next week with another episode with another super cool guest. So uh, in the meantime, have an awesome week. Do good stuff. Look after yourselves. Take care of each other. Fight the power. Spread the truth. Free Julian Assange. Adios, amigos.